All right. Well, welcome to this session on gaining decisions for Jesus. So let's take a look at this and see what it's like and what it takes to do so. Before we do, let's have a word of prayer. God of heaven, thank you for blessing us to have this opportunity to learn the tools that leads people to you. We ask for your anointing upon the presentation and the hearts and minds of each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Witnessing to gain decisions, an often overlooked sign of the nearness of Christ's return is the great number of men and women who are in the valley of decision. It is uncommon, not uncommon, to hear people say, if I ever join a church, it would be the Seventh-day Adventist church. Often these are people who have had Bible studies or some other favorable contact with our teachings. They believe our message, but have not made a personal decision to accept Christ and his message. The prophet Joel in the last days said indecision would be one of the signs of the last days. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. So to get these decisions, brothers and sisters, let's look at the ABCs of decisions. Accept your students where they are. Believe in your students. Have confidence in the Holy Spirit to lead the study and lead you in sharing with them. Let's take a look at the four steps in making decisions. Information. What did I say? Information. information. The information received should be clear. Questions must be answered. Number two is conviction. They must feel that it is what God wants them to do, not what you want them to do. Then number three is desire. They must develop a desire, the desire to do it. And then the last one is what? Action. They must do it. We look at John 8.32 and it says, Truth frees our Bible students to make right decisions because when we know the truth, the truth shall make us free. So we got to be careful when we handle the word of God and this is dealing with individuals. Be careful how we handle the word because that word is to make decisions with the people. Let the word cut and not your words, as it says in manuscript 42. Here we see a caption of Felix with his wife, Drusilla. They were Jewish. She was a Jewish and he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned in a righteousness, temperance and also judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, go thy way for this time when I have now a more convenient season, I will call for thee. This man was convicted, but delayed. And guess what? Because of that delay, he never responded. People need to have conviction. And it is the Holy Spirit to bring about this conviction. You see, when the plain cutting truths of the Bible is presented before people, it comes directly across long cherished desires and lifestyles and confirms habits and people are convicted and then this is when they need our counsel. This desire they must have. Jesus had to talk to these gentlemen here, the disciples, letting Peter know that what he was giving up to follow Christ did not compare to what he intended to bless him with. But the question comes, can we relate to that or can we testify to the goodness of God for what he has planned for us is better than what we're experiencing right now? Think about that, all right? So this desire must be in the heart of the person. Let's look at the action now. This action, that these steps are of gaining decisions for Jesus. We wanna start with the easiest first. When you're gaining decisions for Jesus, you want to let them know that it is dangerous to put off making a decision Share that when we make a change in our lives for Christ, he will bless us with much more. But the question is, can you really relate that to the people that you're relating to, right? Do you have a testimony that you can give that will convey to the people that you're happy in Jesus and you are blessed with even more since you became a child of God? Think about it, because there's a lot of people that says, I'm a Christian now, you know, but I'm broke, you know? <laughs> So when you get these Bible studies, and brothers and sisters, there's an appeal at the end of every study, and that is dealing with gaining these decisions. Make an appeal according to the subject presented. Share God's wonderful promises. That's why the Bible has promises in it. Share our own experiences in finding peace and happiness. We have to have a relationship with Jesus. We have to share our experiences. People will gravitate to wanting to receive what you have, especially when it appears that it is being a blessing to you, right? 
Share his promises. Share the experience of others also when you gain these decisions. Because they may be going through something that you know someone that went through the same thing and God has blessed them through that crisis. Share the great reward of doing right. Remember the Holy Spirit is right there working with you. Because if you think that you just had a desire to do this on your own, think again. It is the Holy Spirit that's prompt your heart to do this for Jesus. Truth and acceptance of truth is progressive. It's what, everybody? Progressive. progressive. Ask the student if he or she understands, was the lesson helpful? And then ask the, the decision question. Now, I want to say this because this is where a lot of people who present Bible studies or even preach sermons mess up. They will preach a sermon, give all of the truth from the word of God, but they don't call for an appeal or a decision. That is wrong as two left shoes. I even would call it a sin. Not giving people an opportunity to respond to the word of God. What's the point then if they don't get a chance to respond to and accept this truth, right? So the acceptance of truth is progressive. Ask them whether or not they understand. Was this lesson helpful? Then, of course, ask the decision question. And you got to do this. Make it plain in your Bible study and in your appeal that the decision question is not to join a denomination or church. What? It's not to join a denom denomination or church. But here's the thing. When you give Bible truth and people want to follow that truth, if your faith, your church is one that stands on that truth, they can't help but join your church. <laughs> okay? But you don't put the cart before the horse. You need to convey to people that you're more interested in them as a person than rather than just trying to get them to join your church. Right? You want to do that. So when we do this progressive ascent, how many of you have given Bible studies before? And you've studied with individuals for a length of time, right? And then you get to the end of that thing and you say, okay, would you like to take your stand and be baptized? And they say, no. And you say, what? I just spent six months with you eight months with you, and you, what? Why is it that they're not saying yes? It's because they have not received progressive assent. The worker must determine at every new step whether the student accepts or rejects the message and how they have decided to integrate these new concepts into their present value structure. If this is not done, resistance will continue to build to the point of total reje rejection. This tells us to gain progressive ascent. What is that? Say you have a series of Bible studies that has, say, 21 lessons in it, like Seeds of Truth. 27 lessons in it, like Amazing Facts, right? And say you take that first lesson, Seeds of Truth is introducing God, then the second lesson is Jesus, then the third lesson is the Holy Spirit, right? And you go through the first lesson, and you get to the end of that lesson, and you ask the decision question, or let's put it this way. You start the lesson, you go through lesson one, then two, then three, go all the way to lesson 21, and you never ask a decision question at the end of any of those lessons until you get to the last one, and then you say, would you like to be baptized? It says, no. It is because you have not gained progressive ascent. What is that? Lesson number one, you're talking about God. Do you believe that there's a God of the universe who created all things? Would you like to get to know him better? Yes. The second lesson, the Son of God. Do you believe in the Son of God that God sent his Son to die for you and give you eternal life should you accept him as your personal Savior? Would you accept him for your Lord and, as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Third lesson, the Holy Spirit. God had to leave. He had left us another comforter and he has left the Holy Spirit here to aid and help us in our walk in serving God daily and even touching our lives to touch somebody else. Do you accept the Holy Spirit to be a part of your life? Do you want the Holy Spirit to be a part of your life? Yes. Guess what I'm getting? Yes, after this lesson. Yes, after this lesson. Yes, after this lesson. And when you get to the last lesson, do you want to be baptized? What do you think the, that answer would be? Yes. Why? Because I've gained progressive consent. It says assent, but it's consent and acceptance, right? Progressive assent is so important. Some people will say, well, hey, 
What if a person accept this lesson and then get to this lesson and then they don't want to accept? You park the car right there and clear the obstacle. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. That's right. That's right. Because here's the thing that I want you guys to understand. Appreciate that. When you give Bible studies to people, you're not giving them Bible studies just for them to know. You're teaching them to teach others. That's how you replicate the kingdom. That's how you ground people, too. Because where are they going when they know what they're talking about? Right? Where are they going when someone approached them and says, why do you worship on that strange day when everybody's going that other day? Instead of them saying the Seventh-day Adventist church said, they will say, it is written. That's what you want to do. That's why you got to teach them to teach others. That's what will ground them. So when you get to those appealed, you got to let them know that light that is not followed turns to darkness. If you don't follow the truth that has been revealed to you, pretty soon it goes out. So you got to encourage your student to put into practice each new duty as it unfolds. What? Somebody said, you don't have to do anything, just believe. Let me tell you something. If you, believe, if you love the Lord, your life will reflect that you love the Lord. We got to see it. What does the Bible say? By their fruits shall ye know them. And the way you carry yourself and to relate to others, you'll know whether or not that person loved that person or not. Amen. So you encourage the student to put into practice each new duty as it unfolds. Therefore, when we're studying these Bible studies with people trying to gain their decision, you want them to follow the counsel by the Holy Spirit, of course, that everything that they learn, they are to move or allow the Holy Spirit to move in their heart to live that principle, too. It is not just just about head knowledge. It is not about lip service. It's life service. Right. Want to do that. And when you do this, you want to make sincere, tactful and timely appeals. Decision questions, and let's say that you, in our evangelism school, we train our evangelists to, to, to give Bible studies just using their Bible, all 28 fundamentals just using their Bible, bam. So usually by not having an outline Bible study that has an appeal question at the end, when you give the Bible study from your Bible, your Bible alone, no matter what subject it is, you gotta make up a decision question, right? So here's some examples here. Have you received Jesus as your personal savior? After you give them the study about Jesus, do you wish to ask Jesus to come into your life? Do you desire to have Jesus write God's law in your heart, meaning you just covered the Ten Commandments, right? Is it your purpose to be ready for Jesus to come and take you to heaven? You just studied about heaven, right? Have you thought of keeping the Sabbath and experienced the benefits of Sabbath keeping? You just talked to them and taught them the lesson on the Sabbath. Do you wish to follow Jesus' example and be baptized? And let me just put it this way. For me, when it comes to those systematic studies, I want the baptism one to be last. Why? Because I don't want people getting baptized, accepting all that that came before that baptismal lesson, and then all this other stuff behind it, and they have the opportunity to say, no, I won't do that. Because we're making disciples. And like I said in the message, not just fellowshippers. Disciples are one who carries a message. But you got a lot of people saying, well, what shall I do then when they hear these Bible truths, right? Here are some specific principles to keep in mind to become more successful in leading men and women to make a favorable decision. What kind of decision? Favorable decision for Christ and his message. A decision for every topic. Ask for a decision based on the material presented at the end of each Bible study. It is unrealistic to expect a favorable decision at the this conclusion of the studies if you haven't obtained progressive decisions at each step along the way. And when you do that, you'll be so surprised. Says, Man, we got to the last lesson. Matter of fact, there'll be some people who want to get baptized as soon as they have the first lesson. But you want to say, be, wait, 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 wait. God has so much for you to do. He has a mission for you to do. And what is that? It's in these lessons. It's in these lessons. See, nobody's going to teach something that they don't believe nor accept. So we, to make disciples with this Bible truth, we got to teach them everything. And you're going to see this. Be sure that they have all the facts. Don't ask for a major decision until your prospect has sufficient information to enable him or her to make an intelligent decision. God wants something in our heads. But let's look at these things because there's evidences of conviction. I always like to say this. In most churches, people are convicted but not converted. 
They're convicted of the truth, but they're not converted. So guess what? The church is full of convicts, but our God is in the business of saving ex-cons. <laughs> I like that. But looking at the evidence of conviction, call for a decision when you see evidences of conviction, learn to recognize decision signals such as the following. What would my neighbor say? What? What if I can't get Sabbath off? They're thinking about that. What if my husband would not allow me to tithe? You know, a lot of these ministers, uh, they all jacked up. You know, husband comes in, you're not going to give that church our money to rip, rip off in the Cadillac fund? No, we're not going to do that. Would I have to quit going to the movies? Because now you just went over the Christian lifestyle, the principles of not defiling your body temple with all of this erroneous stuff that you take in your mind by watching these evil movies and evil music and all of those things, listening to those things. So they're thinking about this, but notice this. Each of the questions revealed that the person has been contemplating and is already considering the consequences of such a decision. In other words, man, if I make this decision, this is going to happen. If I make this decision, you know, my, my, my family's going to be hot, right? They didn't care nothing about you going to the club and to the bar, but the minute, the minute you want to join God's truth, they have a problem. <laughs> Devil works that way. But when you work with people, you ought to always expect a favorable decision. Amen? You want to do that. So you want to de determine the specific obstacles to a decision. We got to clear away the obstacles. Do what, everybody? Ask for a decision. Evidence of emotions. Notice this, and I know this has happened for many of us. When the truth of God's word comes to the attention of a person living out of harmony with God's will, he is at first perplexed. As new light increases, he sees that what he once believed is contrary to God's law. As the evidence accumulates, his perplexity grows and emotional factors may become involved. But please know, your student will soon discover that making a decision to do God's will will require lifestyle changes. But you want to make this faith, the Bible truth that you live, so favorable of a desire that people will want what you have. But if you're teaching them this lesson and you're sad while you're teaching, you know, you know, this is the truth, y'all, but you know, it's tough, though, but it's the truth. Well, talk like that, right? You got to know that God is with you. He's our helping hand, all right? Our responsibility is to give sincere and tactful appeals at the appropriate time. After each study, you want to make that appeal, right? Appeal for a decision to accept Christ. Guess what? This is the first and most important decision to be made, period. The first, that's why in our lesson series, when we give the, the Bible studies, we start out with God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, because we want to introduce them to the God of the universe and Christ the Savior. But they got to accept God. They got to accept Jesus first. If they don't accept Jesus first, everything, what did I say? Behind it is of no avail. Because if they don't fall in love with the author of the Bible truth, the rest of these principles do not mean anything to them. When they fall in love with the author, they're going to want to follow what the author says. So that's why they have to accept Christ first, the most important one to be made. Notice this. How can we speak about God's commandments? Hmm? Don't talk to me about no Sabbath. I don't love Jesus yet, right? About abandoning vices in the life of sin. Our pros prospect does not first accept Jesus if they don't as their personal savior. In every life, Jesus provides motivation to be willing to accept his word and to follow his footsteps. With Jesus, every change is possible. But guess what? They must have a relationship with Jesus. They must develop a relationship with Jesus. Here's the bottom line. When you give these Bible studies, especially in trying to gain decisions, you got to do your very best, your utmost best to connect them with Christ and encourage them to get to know Christ and walk in Christ and fall in love with Jesus eventually, that is the most highest thing that you can possibly do. Because all of the other principles that you will be covering, it will be a cinch when that happens. Very important. Secure to sec surrender to Christ first, all other decisions will be dependent upon this one decision. If people, you begin a Bible study and they says, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't want to hear nothing. Okay. Now, the one thing that we can't do is cause people to believe. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to bring that conviction, right? Because when people come to me and they say, well, what do you think about this? And 
what, what's your thoughts on this? I says, it's not about what I think, it's about what God thinks. So let's go to the word of God, right? Let's check out and see what God thinks. What about it? Because see, what people do is, especially when it comes to certain faiths, well, your church said, you said, so you saying, so you saying I can't do this, you saying I can't do this? You can do what you want to do. The Bible says, don't defile your body temple. I didn't say anything, but here's it, here it is again. If they don't love the Lord, they ain't trying to please him of how they conduct their lives and how they eat and drink and relate. But when you teach them these principles, you got to teach with conviction. Teach with what? Because people know if you believe what you're talking about. They're looking at you, okay, you're teaching all this stuff, and you say all through the week, through the weeks, and you're going through the Bible studies, and when you get through certain Bible studies and everything, they're peeking and watching, and they're looking to see if you <laughs> match up what you're teaching. You know what I mean? They're checking you out. But you can't teach with conviction unless you are convicted of it. Right. You just can't do it. You can't fake it. You can't fake it. You cannot sell what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. So you got to deal with the family's problems. I, I, I think I, with, with Yarman here, I think I had mentioned something about, uh, and, and maybe I was talking to somebody else, but uh, uh, we talk about dealing with the family problems when you're giving Bible studies. It's two phrases, one and the same. Bible instructor, say that. Bible instructor? Say it again. Bible worker. Bible worker. Bible instructor teaches the Bible. A Bible worker deal with family problems, <laughs> okay? Should you feel that it is a problem in hindering, hindering a family's progress, don't shirk the responsibility. Pray about it with the family, and the Lord will give victory. Should the head of the household of the family work on the Sabbath and feel that he will lose his employment, why not pray and help him to find another job? The Lord may give him a better job according to his faith. They need food. You go to the, give the Bible study on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, you get there and there, the babies are crying and they're distressed because they have no money to get no food. Don't talk about, well, we're going to still do the Bible study, right? <laughs> That's wrong as two left shoes, y'all. Yeah. Bible instructor teaches the Bible. Bible worker help people with humanitarian felt needs. Give them a ride to the store. Yeah. Give them money. Don't loan nothing. Give them money to help them. Amen. That's Bible work. Right. That means the Bible truth is in action through your work. Yeah. And aiding humanity. Christ's method alone. That's right. So when you teach this and you have the conviction, right, you want to teach and impress the urgency of obedience. You got to do that. Cite your own experience when the time comes. Okay? If you have not had a personal experience similar to some specific decision at hand, smoking, alcohol, cessation, for example, invite somebody to your Bible study. Say you have a friend that overcame alcoholism or cigarettes and you're dealing with somebody that has that challenge as you're going through the study. Two studies before you get to that subject, invite them to be a part so they don't see it as a setup. Mm -hmm. They come. Then when you get to that subject and they share their experience, then you're a person you invited two studies before give their testimony of the victory that God has given them. And then they'll be like, wow can do it for you, you can do it for me. And that would encourage them. So this is what we are to do, all right? I'm gonna skip through this part right here, but this is the part that I really love. Let God's word answer excuses when people reject accepting Bible truth. Let's look at this. Sabbath study has been presented, the call is made, and the answer is yes. And they say, I admit that the fourth commandment is just as important as the other nine, and I agree, the seventh day is the Lord's day, but I don't see how I can manage to be free from my job on Saturdays. And as you know, I have a family to look after. We are in a time of economic crisis. Yes, I would just have to wait and see what happens. But for now, I cannot see how I can find another job or quit working on Saturdays and still care for my family and manage my finances. This gives you a scenario of what to say. But simply as this, you want to give them Bible texts or promises of what God will do. Even better yet, bring somebody to the study, previous studies before, and let them give their testimony of how God blessed them not to have to work on the Sabbath, especially when they took their stand, and how God blessed them. And here's the thing, we have to trust God. 
But see, people that don't have a relationship with God, they're not trusting God. Oh, no, 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 no. Not at all. That's why a person has to fall in love with Jesus before they even lift up the thought of even trusting him. Right? But you bring somebody in that has a testimony of being able to get the Sabbath off or even get a better job. You do that type of thing for them, right? But when they come up with that thing about, you know, I just can't do this because of, you know, this and that, you want to give them a Bible text that answers that objection or rejection or excuse. Don't try to answer immediately. You want to go to the Word of God and get the scriptures that points to their challenge, right? During the following week, pray much and seek the answer from the Bible, if you haven't already given it. At your next visit, have the student read and explain the text that will provide his answer. In explaining it to you, he would explain it to himself. This is a powerful way to lead a soul to the right decision. So when they take that scripture that you give them that points to the fact that they are rejecting the follow truth because they have no confidence, when you give them that scripture, the Holy Spirit will convict them and they'll be able to see that God is speaking to them in that moment and will help them through it. But let's look at even more. Excuses with the Bible. We must be prepared to meet a person's objection or excuse with a thus saith the Lord, not thus saith Adventist. Okay? We just happen to stand on the word of God. Yes. Following is a partial Bible text for use in meeting some excuses. Gaining decisions with Bible text. Excuse for keeping God's Ten Commandment law. Guess what? You got people that'll say, the law is for the Jews. Here's a text that says, uh-uh, it's for everybody. The law was done away with. Here's a text that says, uh-uh, it's still in place. So when they say these things, you simply share these texts, pray and have them to review the text, and then when you come back together with them, the next time you meet, you say, what did you think about what the Word of God had to say with your statement the law was done away with? <coughs> the Bible now is answering the excuses. They say, I won't be judged by the Ten Commandments. James 2.10 says, you will be judged by the law of liberty. That's the Ten Commandments. Yeah. I love God and therefore he doesn't expect me to keep the Ten Commandment law. John 14.15 says what? If you love me, keep my commandments. It's implied if you don't forget it, <laughs> right? According to the new commandment in Matthew 22, all we have to do is love God and love our neighbors. Combine, that is the first four commandments and then the last six, 10 all together. You give them them scriptures right there and they'll say, whoa, I didn't never seen it like that before. <laughs> what about this? Excuse me for keeping God's fourth commandment, the Sabbath law. It's inconvenient to keep the seventh day and follow this doctrine. Here's a text that shows you, you can. And it's not inconvenient if you love the Lord. See, the key is, if you love the Lord, yeah. if you love the Lord, you can trust the Lord, right? It would cause trouble and division in my home if I take my stand for this teaching. <laughs> Jesus said, yeah, it will in Matthew chapter 10. But if you deny him, he shall deny you. But guess what? Only those who do not love Jesus will deny him. There it is. I can't make a living if I keep the Sabbath. Here's a text that says, yes, you can if you trust God. I lose my job if I keep the Sabbath. Look at all the texts you can share. The disciples didn't worship on Saturday. Here's all the text that says that's the only day they worship as far as keeping holy. I keep the day of rest on Sunday, the first day of the week. I was raised this manner. Here's the text that says, yeah, I know, but God says. God knows my heart. Oh, yes, he does. And I keep the commandments. It's not necessary to keep Saturday. James 2.10, you offend in one, you're guilty of all. All these texts. On and on and on. It doesn't matter what day I worship on. Here's a text that proves you wrong. And it goes on and on and on. What about this? Excuse for it regarding the church. There are too many hypocrites in the church. A lot of people say that. Now, when you go out in the world and you go into all these places that have a lot of crowd of people, right, especially like a sporting event and stuff like that, if you were to take a bullhorn or a microphone and say, how many of y'all of you out here is a Christian? Most of those people will raise their hand. And most of those people have drinks in their hand, beer and wine and everything else, but they claim to be a Christian. Guess what? That's an arena or a stadium full of thousands upon thousands of people who's claiming to be Christians, which makes them all hypocrites. Now, take your pick. 
a big stadium crowd of hypocrites or the seven or eight in the church. <laughs> when they say too many hypocrites in the church, I believe it's not necessary to unite with a church. Acts 2, 47, add to the church daily such as should be saved. I can still be saved if I don't attend church, Acts 2, 47. It doesn't, God doesn't require me to attend church, Hebrews 10, 4, forsake, 10, 24 and 25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So here it is, the Bible is covering the excuses that people are making. I can't leave my church, here's the text. Babylon's fallen, is fallen, come out of her, my people. God has people in Babylon. Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them I also must bring. I can't leave my friends and relatives. Here's the text. My pastor and family and friends continue to tell me that I'm wrong. Here's the text. What about this one? And this is a tough one here. Because people want to, uh uh, Ellen White, who's that? Y'all following this woman. They say, I only need the Bible. But here the Bible says in Revelation 12 17, the devil is mad with those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19 10 says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, which is the writings of the prophets, all the prophets of the Bible, and also the true prophets that do not have a canon in the Bible. Yes, Revelation 22, 9 says God's people have always had a prophet among them, and they're not to be worshipped. I don't believe in following a person. Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, then there is no light in them. I don't see how Ellen White's writings can be inspired. Here's the Bible truth there. I don't want to be a part of a church that follows a prophet or prophetess. 2 Chronicles 20, 20, believe in my prophets and ye shall prosper. So here's the text. What about the Christian lifestyle? And again, let me back up on this one when it comes to this one of Ellen White. When you go through that particular study with Ellen White, it might be number 24 in Amazing Facts, number 18 in Seeds of Truth. What you do when you complete that study, you take a steps to Christ and says, I want you to read this and tell me what you think. And then they come back. Wow, that was inspiring. Tell me whether or not that person is lifting up themselves or lifting up Jesus. No, that really helped me in my spiritual walk. Praise God. Okay, you like that? Here's Desire of Ages. They study that. Oh, you like that? Here's counsels and diets on foods. Wow, this is really helping my health and everything. Man, this is marvelous. See, people are down on what they're not up on. So you let them taste and see that the Lord is good with this spirit of prophecy in God's last day church. The thing you don't do is force it on them because it's true. We only need the Bible, but God has given us a special gift to look at the details of the Bible when it comes to the principles. The Bible gives us broad principles that covers all the sinful things. The spirit of prophecy breaks those broad principles down in detail. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. The spirit of prophecy says, all these things that you put in your body and the things you drink and eat and all this stuff that you do kills your body. It goes into detail. So when people throw away the spirit of prophecy, they don't realize they're throwing away the Bible because everything the spirit of prophecy is written on is the Bible. But you want them to test and see and prove that this is of God or of that person. And that's why you start with steps to Christ, desire of ages, counsels and diets and foods, then hit them with the GC, great controversy and watch what happens, amen? What about the excuses in the Christian lifestyle? I might as well keep living the way I have been and the way most people do. Romans 12, 1, God wants us to commit ourselves to living sacrifice. God does not pay attention to, any, attention to any way I live, the way I live, eat, or the things I do with my body. There's a text, it's my body, I can do whatever I want to do. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you are bought with the price, you are not your own. All these are answering these excuses. I can't get past the temptations. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, what does it say? There's no temptation that is taking you that is not as common to man. But God is making a way of escape if you are tempted, that you can get past it. What about the excuses for baptism? I've been saved already. Here's a text that shows you you got to be baptized of the water and of the spirit. I don't think it's necessary to be baptized. John 3, 3 and 5. You got to be born of the water and of the spirit. Arise and be baptized. First Peter 3, 21, we ought to be baptized. I've already been baptized at my old church. Acts 19, 1 through 5 is a prerequisite for rebaptism when they learn new truth, especially present truth. And they'll be led by the spirit. I don't want to get baptized just yet. I use this text today. Arise and be baptized. Why wait? Why tarry us down? More decision text. I can't leave my church. Here's the text. I'm too great of a sinner. Here's the text. 
Uh huh. I'm afraid that I can't hold out. Here's the text. He will keep you from falling. I can't live up to the truth. Not in your own strength. There's that text again. Here's the text that tells them that they can. I'm not good enough. Here's the text. People would talk about me. Here's the text. My friends would ridicule me. Here's the text. We don't have to come up with anything, brothers and sisters. The word of God gives these answers to their excuses. My husband, my wife, my father, my brother, and my sister will oppose me. The Bible says in Matthew 10, yeah, I come to send a sword. It will divide a house. You stand for me, people are going to hate you. But if you choose them and deny me, I'll deny you. <laughs> but guess what? If they don't fall in love with Jesus, that's what's going to go down, right? This thing right here. There's one thing, movie, jewelry, tobacco, etc., which I cannot give up. Here's the text that says, yes, you can. No, not now. Here's the text. It goes on and on and on. I'm waiting for my husband. All of these things. All of this. You got a full boatload of ammunition of answering Bible, excuse, I mean, excuses with Bible text. So when you get to the point of sharing these particular texts with them, you want to help them to offer decisions on their knees. Offer decision prayers often on their knees. This is where it should be made. Counsel often with the person that trains you. All right? Conduct Sabbath vespers. Now they've accepted the Sabbath. They don't know how to keep the Sabbath. Right? So you are to bring them in, bring them with you in vespers. Have, to have them come to your home and you open up the Sabbath together. Or go to their home and open up the Sabbath together. Right? They made their decision for truth. Join in and ushering in their first Sabbath. Right? Now that means you're going to have to do it. <laughs> right? Lord help us all. Accompanied by your spouse and children, begin the Sabbath together, both families united. Accompany the family to church. You invite them to church. When they get there, don't allow them to sit over there and you sitting over here. You know what the devil's going to do? He's going to send them, their, send their way, the biggest hypocrite in the church that's going to discourage them in some way. He, he's he's, he's going to fix it. He's going to make sure that happens. So you want to accompany them to the church. And as they attend their first Sabbath, Sit with them. But let's look at how to win men real quickly here. Preacher Christ is a man's man. Not necessarily reading all this, but you know, a lot of people look at Jesus, some softy, so loving, so graceful and everything. Jesus didn't play that. He had a presence. He goes into the temple and whip out all the money changers. He did all of that. He didn't, take no he, was a, he didn't take no mess. Now, you ever heard this phrase? See, people do what you let them do, and some people know who they can do it to and who they can't. They knew that they could not cross him. That's why they wanted to get rid of him, right? Recall how the money changers in the temple were frightened by the reproachful word and the appearance of this, the manner of this leader of men. Gotta be, he was a man's man, okay? You got to let them know, especially if you're dealing with the father, that they are to be one they've considered to, be gl to glorify fatherhood. God has put them in a position that they are responsible for their family, Okay? emphasizing the responsibility of a father to his own family do expect obedience respect and politeness from our children yes we do should not we cultivate the same virtues in relation to our heavenly father as we make promises to our children so God has made sure promises to his children teach a prophetic message and, the, and this remnant church does that in some places I better say that <laughs> all right Men are deeply interested in the future. They want to know whether there is a sure God, any sure God to understanding the future, right? Present the Bible message logically. Nicodemus was attracted to Christ by his teaching, for it was logical and systematic. Talked about this today, Nick at night, right? He snuck away. Emphasize the necessity of courage. Standing firm for the truth will set a man apart as an individual of conviction, principle, and character. Such a man may well become a leader, and what man doesn't dream of becoming a leader. Stress the importance of the father's decisions. His decision will be the deciding factor in winning other men and also his own what? His own family. Action speaks in thunderous tones and are mightier than words. Got to do that. Challenge men with large projects. And this is why I say it's easier to get people to take a look at a church and say, yeah, I'd like to be a part of that because it's a church on a mission. There are churches that are missionless. They're doing nothing. So you can't win men to come and just sit and look and, okay, that's it. What is this? I need to be challenged. I need to have something that I can fit into, something that I can be a part of that's positive, that's going somewhere. So challenge them with large projects in your church. That's why it's more than just a sermon song and a prayer. we got to have a mission. 
and a whole lot of things going on in the church to win men to be a part of it, and also ladies too. Influence on loved ones and friends. Some people say they don't have no influence. All of us have influence. You see, God has given us the power of choice. And he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit when we ask for it. And there's another power that we have in exercise every day, and we don't even think about it. And that is the power of influence. We influence somebody to heaven or Hades every day by our actions. So those are the things that we need to understand and we can share that with people. The individual decision to assure salvation. How often have you heard a family member say, I'm going to wait for my husband or wife and then we'll get baptized together. You share with them Ezekiel 14. And in this particular chapter, it's an unusual chapter, but the thought practically is saying the same words even in verse 14, 16, 18, and 20. Each verse emphasizes that even though one's parents and Christians that are Christians, that fact does not assure the children's salvation. Each individual child must make their own decision for truth and right. How do I know that? Because two birds can get married and have a bird. Two monkeys can get married and have a monkey. Two squirrels can get married and have a squirrel. But two Christians can get married, but they do not produce a Christian. <laughs> that person must become a child of God in their own relationship with God. It's not automatic. And that's why you have so many people that grow up in the church, their families are in the church, and when they come to the realization that they're in this family, oh, we go to church, there's a lot of people who can't even tell you when they became a Christian. Oh, I was born in the church. I was born in the family already going to church. Wait a minute, when did you ever connect with Jesus? When did you have that aha uh -huh moment? When, when, what your life was before you became a Christian? I don't know, I was always a Christian. No, you were not. You had to have some kind of experience where the light bulb came on that connected you with Christ and that you have a new birth experience. Something had to happen, but many in the church has not had that experience. Some has gone through the academies, universities, colleges, and all of that, come out of there not knowing Jesus. That's what happens to them. And many think just because they're born in the church or born in a household of a family that goes to church, they were automatically a Christian when they was born. No, it doesn't work like that. You got to let them know the danger of delaying a decision. The door of probation may soon be closed. Among the saddest words recorded in the Bible are those spoken by Jesus in Matthew 25, 10, and the door was shut. And why was it shut? They didn't accept John 3, 16. <laughs> they messed up. Two classes of people at the end, saved and lost. Think about it. You got to let them know that it's a matter of life or death. Make plain in your Bible study and in your appeal that this is a decision that will determine eternal life or death. Not just the decision to join a particular denomination or church. This will decide truth or what? For the Christ or for the world. The result of the decision will be salvation or destruction. Picture the love of God. Emphasize the thought that Jesus Christ loves the student as an individual. Christ died on the cross for the student. Jesus cares so much for him that if he were the only individual living in the world, Christ would have died for him alone. Christ is our example of how we relate to one another. Amen. God's care and his interest. Remind the Bible student that if God cared for him even before he became obedient, because that's what people think about. Wait a minute, if I keep the Sabbath, man, oh, I got to return time. How much is it? 10%? Whoa, I can't make it. If God took care, for, took care of you before you gave your life to him, and now that you're going to put him first, don't you think that he's going to care for you even more? I can testify to this. The tithing offering that my wife and I render, we can't explain how we have the level of life that we're living because the money don't match. We live on blessings. Amen? So when you let people know that God cares so much about you. Your life is not going to go down when you give it. That's why you can't say, well, I'm a Christian. I used to be a Christian, but now I'm a Christian and I'm broke all the time. No. Something's wrong there. <laughs> Need for Christ's approval. You crave the smile of his approbation on your life. Yes, we all want to do that. You got to relate your own experiences when you go through this. You got to vividly portray the triumph of truth. And you got to be a person with courage. Like I spoke today and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm studying that devotional book, Conflict and Courage, because that's the way this road is, especially in the last days. But it takes courage to be a 
Christian, brothers and sisters. But there are decisions that hold people back, that has them chained. And these are iron bands. Most people are held back from making their decision for truth in these three areas right here. And here they are. Temporal interest. What did I say? Fear of losing a job. If I make that decision, man, they're going to fire me. Lack of faith to begin tithing. I'm already broke of the Ten Commandments, and now you said be more broke, right? Habits such as smoking and drinking. They're worried about that when all you got to do is just surrender your heart to Jesus, and he'll take care of that. Family ties. Opposition from a loved one. They had no problem with you going to the clubs and all of these worldly events and stuff, drinking and smoking and doing drugs and everything, but the minute you decide to join this church, they have a problem. Fear of dividing the family. You do that, you're going, where you going? We, we've always been this. Why are you doing that? This is why people take such a stand. Then they have church and social ties. Prestige of belonging to a popular church, Bethel Baptist, 10,000 square foot church. Huh? Sentimental tie to the family church. Our great, great, great grandmother went to the church all the way down the line, and now you're going to break the cycle? What's wrong with you? And at the same time, hardly any of them go to church. Fear of losing friends, fear of ridicule, opposition from a pastor who didn't even know your name until he found out you was going to go to that other church. This is what they do. But here's some decision questions that will be helpful. When you get to that lesson, you get to the end, is everything clear? Huh? You know what you should do, right? What keeps you from doing it? You plan to do it sometime, don't you? Why not do it now? It's vitally important to determine why the student is not committing to a decision to accept Christ completely. When you know a person has accepted Christ and believes the doctrines, yet still fails to make a complete decision, an approach such as this, I sense there's something holding you back. Could you share with me what it is? I know you believe what we have studied together, but something is troubling you. What is it? Once you discover what the problem is, you will have an opportunity to find a solution. Decisions on spiritual matters are based on a love relationship with Jesus. There it is again. Kept trying to tell you in the beginning, they got to fall in love with Jesus. For a deeper study on this thing, we recommend reading the book Evangelism thoroughly. Here in summary are some of the principles you may want to study further in the book, and here they are. The love of Christ, there it is, is the only power that can soften the heart and lead to obedience. Let's say, accept Jesus. Kindly words, little attentions, Christ-like sympathy, have power to open the door to hearts. In other words, you're doing personal things for them, helping them, not trying to shove the Bible study down their throat. Success depends upon your ability to find your way to the current of their thoughts. What is it? There's power and exaltation excuse me, of the cross. When you go after decisions, don't give up easily. You may not get affirmative decision the first time you ask for it. Ask again. It's like proposing marriage, Andrew. Ask again. The decision to grow out of a love relationship of following the four basic areas of decision leading a person to a full surrender, and here they are. Christ, the first one, the decision to accept Christ as a personal savior. Sabbath, the decision to keep all of God's commandments. Reforms, the decision in favor of health principles, Christian standards, etc. Membership, the decision to come out of Babylon and unite with the remnant church. So let's look at some helps of making decisions. Prayer, pray with and for your Bible student. Teach them to pray for how can he be expected to make right decisions if he doesn't know how to pray. And then you go back to these Bible promises especially when it's needed at the appropriate time. And then when you've gone through the study, they decided they've accepted and everything. And they decided that they want to take their stand even to be baptized. You go to church with them. You sit with them. They make that public confession of Christ. And guess what? Your pastor, if he's worth his salt, he's making a decision. At, he's making an appeal to call for a decision at the end of his message. Guess what? You walk forward with them. You don't let them take that lonely walk by themselves. They're in a strange place. They say they come from a church that's full of love. They don't, want to, they don't need to come to a church that has God's unadulterated truth, and it feels like a skating rink. Cold is an ice cube. So you walk forward with them, okay? Expression deepens impression. One way of deepening the impressions of the interest is to have them fill out a decision card when they do that. 
One man who, with his wife, received Christ on a Sunday evening in their home and announced to them, to the men on the job, first thing Monday morning, I became a Christian over the weekend, he said. And he did this because he knew that it would be harder for him to go back on his decision if the men on the job knew he had made it. But how do you prepare a person for a baptism? You gain their decisions by the Holy Spirit, of course. You take them through the 13 vows, okay? Carefully review the major teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This can be accomplished through a thorough Bible correspondence course or an evangelistic meeting. Briefly review the teachings of the church in case where the individual has completed a series of studies. Okay, you study with them. You take them through that. You go through the 13 vows. You heard me read the 13 vows today. Every one of those vows is attached to a Bible study. So when you ask the question of the vow, they ought to know what study you're talking about. They need to know. These are vows to Jesus and not to a church. At this point, you may wish to have the prospective members sign the baptismal vow on the back of the certificate as he has read and agreed to follow. You pray with them afterwards. But notice what Ellen White says in Evangelism 308. The test of discipleship. I told you it's about discipleship, not fellowship. The test of discipleship is not brought to bear as closely as it should be upon those who present themselves for baptism. When they give evidence that they fully understand their position, they are to be accepted. And guess what? That evidence is works. That evidence shows their faith. It shows their faith that they believe. Amen? The Bible promises of the Holy Spirit to those who repent and are baptized. So the question is, brothers and sisters, when you lead a person to decision, you want to make sure that they fall in love with Jesus first. You want to cover all of their questions, all of their objections with a dust saith the Lord. Amen? Amen? You want the Bible to make, give the answers to their excuses so they can never say the Seventh-day Adventist Church said or you said. No, they will go to the word of God and say it is written. When someone challenges them and say, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you do this? Why won't you do that? You need not ever say, well, I think or our church says. When Jesus was tempted, when he went into that desert after being baptized, when Satan came to him, Christ went to the word, Matthew 4, 4, it is written. So you want to teach them, not just for them to know, but for them to teach others. That's how it works. And you can gain decisions for Christ. But the first and, fo first and foremost thing that must take place, the thing that must take place, they must accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior first. To be led to fall in love with him. And if they don't, none of the rest of the principles exposed in this Bible would mean anything to them. Are you ready to gain decisions for Jesus? Yes. Let's go. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your blessings upon us. We know, O oh God, that the time is short and is nearing its end. But you've called us for a great work. And this work is great because you're in the midst of it. So we ask now, Lord, that you would touch each and every one of our hearts, Lord, to take these gems that has been shared, Lord, from the book Evangelism in your word. And we're asking, oh God, that you will bless us, every person we talk to. May it go towards to them this truth, and we know it will not return void. Thank you for the blessing of it all. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.